January 3rd, 2019. This is Everyday Truth, Lisa Chu. Um, today I spent uh, educating myself on the work of Nadine Burke Harris, the author of a book entitled The Deepest Well, published just last year, 2018, as well as the founder of the Center for Youth Wellness Hunters Point in San Francisco, which is a troubled community neighborhood in terms of socioeconomic factors um, and is a place where she's starting a clinic or she has started a clinic, a free clinic to comprehensively address health problems as a pediatrician. Um, and I came across an article of hers last night, which I shared to Facebook. And the reason I shared it was because she was telling the story of when she first discovered the ACE study, which is ACE stands for Adverse Childhood Event Study, published in 1998 by a physician named Felitti, uh, based in San Diego, using 17,000 patient um, data from the Kaiser Permanente database to look at the correlation between adverse childhood events, which were defined um, as a list of um, 10 things, including psychological, emotional, physical abuse, witnessing domestic violence, having a parent who um, was addicted to substances, um, and witnessing other forms of violence. So the, the main finding of the study was that more than half and up to two-thirds of all of the 17,000 people asked reported at least one of these events. And surprisingly, about a third 25% of them reported more than three. And they looked at um, the likelihood of having one of the 10 major disease killers of people in the United States, heart disease, COPD, diabetes, obesity, asthma, um, et cetera, cancer. And um, it was just staggering how there was a dose-response relationship between the number of adverse child events, childhood events that people reported and the incidence and likelihood of having one of these chronic diseases later in life. So it's a fascinating um, study to start making up stories about, you know, mm -hmm. why. Um, and there has been some science now done mm -hmm. on why and what happens when there's a chronic stress response starting in childhood. Um, meaning a fight or flight traumatic response chronically over time. Um, and it's like so many of us have taken that to be the normal in adulthood that um, this study that's now being reported as this revolutionary finding, it's like, yeah, <laughs> childhood trauma is not a new phenomenon, but we're now looking at it in a different way for some reason. And so that led me to um, watching both Dr. Harris's TED Talk on this subject and then a one hour Q&A that she did at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco. She's a very dynamic speaker and fundraiser and she's the perfect CEO for this project. Um, and it also led me to, and, and so I, I, I found myself getting involved in her story. Like, you know, how did she, come into this work because she she's also calling out her own medical education and which was at top institutions and you know she did her residency in pediatrics at Stanford she has an MPH from Harvard and she said you know the entire time in her training as a pediatrician she was told that trauma was a quote social problem like society's problem or a quote mental health problem which means you refer it out to the uh, social worker or therapist and it's their problem and you sort of stay focused on what a doctor does which is the organic disease and so she was never taught to ask about these um, the presence of these problems 
um, until she saw a case uh, in her own practice. And she tells the whole story beautifully in this Common Love Club video. But basically, she said that she had to start putting it together herself, like what she was seeing. And I kind of did a little sleuthing into her background. And she's the daughter of immigrants from Jamaica. And her parents are scientists. And she talked on stage about how her dad was a biochemist, is a biochemist. And would always use every single instance in life to try to teach her something about science that was going on. And I was sitting there watching this and really taking it in, thinking about my own trajectory of like when I stopped thinking, when I stopped allowing myself to have ideas and to be curious and to look at things in the world and have a perspective on them. And this is a really, really sad thing for me. My heart is racing a little bit right now as I say it because it's, I know the moment and I feel a lot of shame as an adult looking at the fact that I was an adult. I was a young adult, 18 years old, and I still had no voice. I had no voice against the pedestal I had placed my family's instructions on. And this is cultural, and it's also personal. So not everyone in the, uh, in the culture has this, but I personally somehow elevated my parents to the level of, like, they actually knew what they were talking about. And I think that I was very motivated by fear because anytime I questioned, like, whether what they were doing was making any sense, I was immediately attacked with huge annihilation rage festivals that crush me down to nothingness. And so to regain the will to live required me to convince myself that or or live in a way that kept me out of that danger and convince myself that what they were saying and the instructions that are that I was following and felt very held by actually made sense. But that was a big lie. And I remember the moment that I was in college, like off of my own, finally. You'd think that I was independent, but no. And I finally connected with a moment that I knew what I wanted to study. I had an idea. I just had an idea. I, I knew. And I made the mistake of sharing that knowing with my family, which I had a habit of talking to them every day on the phone, which it took me 35 years to figure out that I don't need to do that anymore. But um, at that time, I was checking in with them. They were like my only friends and confidants in the world. And, and they, they had convinced me that they were the only people that I could trust in the entire world. And I understand the original intention of that as a young child to tell, tell me that, that they were to be trusted. But to create a closed world where only their advice and only their perspective are trustworthy, be cross the line into pathology, uh, in my view, now as an adult. But I remember um, being very excited and very clear about what I wanted to do and calling home and then getting the response from my dad that, nope, he's not going to pay for that, that he's not going to pay for me to read books. I wanted to study history and literature. And now I laugh because, like, I've come all the way back to this through all of my shedding of layers and struggling and um, trying to reclaim pieces of myself. I've come back to the heart and soul and core of who I am, which is, yes, I love the story, the history, and the literature, the, the context and the stories that people have and how that is the fabric of our existence and is a, such a useful way of looking at things. And I think it's ironic that, that this awakening to trauma, to childhood trauma and its impact on adult health outcomes is begging us to, as a society and a culture to consider our history and our literature, our context of the events that were surrounding us in our lives and what happened to us, as well as the stories 
that we carry from those events. And, um, and here I am back studying that um, once I freed myself to actually be interested in things again. So I had a moment of remembering that and remembering like how actually when I was three or four years old graduating from preschool, somehow I had been brainwashed to say that I wanted to be a pediatrician on the stage at my graduation from preschool. And uh, my teacher said, do you know what pediatrician means? And I said, yes, a baby doctor. And I think it was because my whole world was just very, very dominated by adults. I was the youngest and my next oldest sibling was seven years older. So everyone was having a very adult conversation around me all the time. I idolized every, you know, my parents and my brother. And then I had these teachers always around me and so and, and then the doctor was the other adult that was in my life so that's all I knew so somehow I knew that it wasn't okay to be a teacher because <laughs> they don't make enough money and then um, pediatrician was okay at the time but then somehow later in medical school when I was actually like trying to acquiesce and find a specialty that I would actually be able to at least endure at minimum a residency in I was like maybe just internal medicine. I remember just completely throwing out the idea of family medicine or pediatrics because of the money factor. And I know that, that there's a lot of people that will listen to this and say that was smart advice. Thank you. But also not smart because that limited my choices to these things that were totally unpalatable but I knew would make other people happy because they supposedly had the right income attached to them. And we all know that there's so many different ways to make make a path in a given field. And it's just, we know, we just know in our hearts that people who use fear to dissuade people from following a clear knowing are projecting their own trauma onto others. But it's still a life that you're impacting, you know, when, you, when you're in your unconscious trauma. And so I want to just be clear that I'm in this huge investigation of trauma, in intergenerational trauma, historical trauma, silence, shame, secrecy, culture, um, and how we protect the people that traumatize us for various reasons. And I'm focused right now on feeling my experience because my whole life has been focused on identifying with others. And, and I think that's what I wanted to say is that this huge wave of grief hit me today. And I cried pretty hard for, like, while trying to eat. <laughs> I was eating and crying. I was crying pretty hard um, today just suddenly when I thought of all of this. And I realized that the thing that I feel the most shame about now is I review my life. And that is the biggest taboo that I'm not allowed to say, and I'm going to say it right now, is my healing process is that I believed that everything my parents were doing and saying was at some level right. And they instilled that in me through this systematic kind of that unspoken cultural layer of Confucianism that everybody older than you is right. And then the second layer was that fear, intimidation through rage and annihilation in response to anything that I tried to question them on. So I can go into trying to explain their behavior, or why they were the way they are, but I'm not gonna do that right now because I'm gonna go back to the sexual abuse analogy. When you have a child who has gone through systematic, repetitive sexual abuse, in the healing process right away, the first time when they talk about it to somebody, it is not generally accepted that you steer the child into trying to understand the adults in their lives and why they acted the way they were. Even though in all likelihood, those abusers were abused themselves and traumatized themselves in some way. We know that. But the treatment for the person who experienced the abuse is not to empathize with the abuser, except in the case of emotional abuse. Why is this? This is my big question. Why has emotional abuse stayed silent so much longer than uh, sexual abuse or physical abuse? 
we have come to the point in society where we don't accept physical abuse and sexual abuse anymore, but verbal abuse, emotional neglect, and intimidation through rage are things that can still stay inside the closed doors of home with nobody ever finding out. Because here's, you know, what I, I love Dr. Harris's message about she's trying to screen and prevent for child adverse childhood events by asking every single one of her four-year-old patients, you know, all of these questions about abuse and what's going on in the home. And for the parents who are actually answering those questions honestly, that's great. They finally have somebody to talk to. Maybe a mother finally gets to tell somebody about her husband abusing alcohol or abusing her or or a sexual abuse that she witnessed with her child. But what about the mother who is doing the abuse? How likely is she to actually respond honestly to the pediatrician if there's no physical evidence of what she's doing? That's the question I'm interested in, as well as the question, what are the cultural and or religious and or other belief systems that factor into what we consider abuse and what we're willing to report. So all of these public figures that are talking finally about this subject, thank God, Oprah did what she called herself a life-changing report uh, last year on trauma-informed care and childhood trauma. Says it's changed every single interaction she has with her employees and all the charities that she works with that um, she wants to educate people about addressing trauma. And I want to say this about trauma, being somebody who is waking up to it and learning about it and looking at it and noticing that and, and working with clients, um, that there's so much that keeps people in silence and secrecy. And we need to understand that. We need to not just talk about the word shame, but to really dive into what is it that causes us as adults even. Once we realize, we've read things, we realize, we recognize, we've distanced ourselves, we've created boundaries, but we still protect our abusers by not admitting what happened to us. And every single piece of literature and every single person working in this field because they actually get to reach patients that are talking about it. They talk about how the breaking of the secrecy is the very first step of healing. And I know from having felt around and avoided the subject and held this in my heart and talked to people who don't want to go there, but so, so they'll talk around it with me as long as we don't blame certain people, that there's so much that holds, holds us back from making that transition into healing ourselves and actually stopping the cycle of intergenerational trauma. Because as long as we stay in denial, and denial means I'm fine. Even though I was traumatized, I definitely am not handing this down. I'm definitely doing it differently. If we're totally convinced of that without having ever gone through any kind of transformational process in ourselves, I don't trust that. I don't believe what you're saying because you're not willing to look really deeply inside yourself and feel. And um, that may be the depth of your own trauma. But um, if we want to talk about stopping the cycle of handing trauma from one generation to another, we need to look at what keeps people in the silence. How do we end those structures of shaming and secrecy that lock people out of healing and into their own prison of shame? And I felt today, it was, it was, I'm really, really embarrassed to admit as an adult how long I wanted to idolize and protect my parents in their heroic story of what they did to raise me into this great person. And I say this, I, because of the pushing that I received to do certain things based on status, and whether it was unconscious or not, I did it to please them, I was, I remained empty until with all of the degrees 
and all of the accomplishments that I once held as the pinnacle of who I was, now I realize those are the shell of an emptiness waiting to be filled with someone else's measures of what I'm worth. And so after all of this heroic immigrant story of raising me and telling me that they knew exactly what I needed to do in life, I was actually left with nothing inside to uh, base real security on. And it was all about waiting for some outside validation in the form of a job, a, an affiliation with an institution, another degree, whatever, just always, and, and always comparing to try to figure out where I stand in this, in this, in this rat race of a world. And now I've discovered on my own by completely consciously letting go of not only consciously putting their voices out of my head by not talking to them on a daily basis and sometimes not for years, healthy decision for me personally and for many people that I know on this path, and two, actually letting myself have ideas again and actually see myself. It's been a very long journey. Maybe you don't think so, but maybe it's not that long, but it's, I guess, for my traumatized fight or flight mind that wanted things to be immediate, it's been a long journey of trying a lot of things and constantly feeling like I don't know what to call myself and I don't know what, what, what box to put this in, so it must not be anything. And so now to hear people, so now Oprah has validated it, so it's all okay now. <laughs> no. The um, it's I've had to piece back together my own sense of worth, not just by myself, but through the search for the kinds of relationships that are really valuing what's inside me, not my accomplishments and not my ability to please that person, but to help me see me. And that's the most revolutionary thing that I have acquired for myself in this journey. That's what enables me to have this voice right now and to say what's happening for me without flinching. And that is a hard-earned place in my life that I have come to through my own determination and whatever you want to call it. I've, I have drawn a lot of lines in the sand for myself on my own behalf. And the whole time, it took me till like, today I realized that that next layer of the onion for me is my own shame about how long it took me to grow up and see that my parents were just humans. They weren't the godlike figures that the child in me had elevated them to for whatever reason. My, it was my own response to the trauma of, ha of being terrorized into the, the inability to, to have my own thoughts about it. So I'm really interested in getting into the nuances of how culture, how specific cultures define trauma differently. And I'm really, really curious to, for instance, take this ACE study and ask my Taiwanese psychodrama colleagues whether this questionnaire would apply in Taiwan. Because one of the questions, for example, is, um, psychological abuse, um, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often at insult or put you down or often or very often act in a way that made you afraid that you would be physically hurt? I would love to see the numbers for that in Taiwan and in China um, because those are pretty much accepted as good parenting practices 
to be used whenever necessary to get the result that you want from your kids. And I want to be proven wrong. I want to see that, you know, in 2018, things are very different in Asia. I would love to see that result. My guess is it's not. Um, because we have, and so this all ties into Asia also because I don't think we have to take an ACE study to know that those countries had active warfare on the ground during the 20th century. Um, we've never had active combat on the ground. We're getting really hyped up about school shootings and everything, which is our, our experience of violence. The types of violence that were witnessed on the ground in those countries starting before World War II and continuing until the 1980s is something we can't imagine. So um, the, the implications of whatever's coming out of this childhood trauma research are going to be global. And um, I'll also say that the interventions, the prevention that Dr. Harris mentioned, her list of six remedies for um, toxic stress, is what she calls it, are sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health, and healthy relationships. And that's a great prescription, isn't it? Don't we all know that we all benefit from doing more of those? And I don't disagree that doctors should um, do their part in telling people what to do with those things. But um, the very nature of traumatic response is we don't sleep regularly. Um, we get into extremes of catatonia or hyperactivity, brain activity. We forget about our bodies so we don't exercise or eat right. And then mindfulness, great. We tend to be workaholics, um, you know, running around struggling. So mindfulness is like a funny idea. That's a great thing that we'll do when we go on vacation or a retreat, if we have that luxury. Um, and then, you know, mental health and healthy relationships, great. Um, absolutely, totally agree. And where do we begin? And what if a healthy relationship for a child means you shouldn't be living with your family anymore? Uh, that's a really sad scenario that unfortunately happens for people and they have to go and find those healthy relationships outside their home. And that's a reality as even for Oprah. Um, if Oprah said it, it's all cool. She said, you know, since she was being beaten physically at home and sexually abused by other kind of extended family that her healthy relationships happened at school and there were some pivotal teachers in her life that believed in her and valued her for what she was inside. Her attributes like being a great reader. I mean, I mean she <laughs> claims that she has no residual effects from her childhood trauma, and I really hope that that's the case um, and that her own tendency to overwork and do all the time is not her version of the high end of the PTSD reaction, but that's not my business. Um, I think it's great that she has been public about the fact that um, that this is a life-changing story for her to report on and that she's, it's changed the way that she sees all of the people in her life. Um, so that's what I have to say today. January 3rd, 2019. Thanks for listening.